the ones on the screen? You can talk with me now. Okay, yeah. so I can see yeah. Ali and Mark can hear me now. Okay. Hi, can you hear us? <coughs> can you hear me? <laughs> so we should get started as we're behind schedule actually. <coughs> And uh, Vivian, Janus, Janus, what's up? <laughs> all right, well, um, thank you all for coming to this event. Um, Thank you to our panelists. Let me just get started with this discussion. I'm very, very glad that we have the moment to have this, uh, this opportunity to discuss about something so important as the nature of the social contract and social cohesion. Uh, in our previous panel, we had a moment to, to discuss about water diplomacy. And one of the things that emerged from that was actually that you know, social cohesion is the one tool that we have all in our hands to address issues related to climate change. Uh, is, is the one quintessential one. So allow me just to start with uh, a bit of the script. We have our two fellow speakers online. This is an impact dialogue that is titled Rethinking the Social Contract, uh, Harnessing the Power of Global Citizens. We aim to reimagine the global contract and we would like to be able to respond to the 21st century unprecedented challenges, such as climate change, conflict, and socioeconomic inequalities. We're trying to call for a renewal of the social contract built on trust, inclusion, and valuing what matters to people and the planet, and more importantly, human dignity. And this is one thing I would like to stress. We are very much basing and angling this whole uh, discussion on the idea of human dignity. This session will feature a panel of prominent professionals uh, and thought leaders. Senator Rosa Galvez of Canada will speak about the nature of strength of the current social contract and how climate change affects new difficulties and necessitate new answers. Foreign Minister uh, Nikola Dimitrov, President and co-founder of the NGO Solution and former Foreign and Deputy Prime Minister for European Issues of North Macedonia, will present a perspective on European affairs and solution-oriented approaches. Um, Janos Kolka hasn't reached us yet. Uh, and, uh, he will be uh, presenting about essential lessons from his experience in his native country, Hungary, and the importance of technology and innovation. I believe he will join us shortly. Uh, Ambassador Mark Lagon online, uh, he's waving his hand. Uh, our Ma Ambassador Mark Lagon is the chief policy officer at Friends of Global Fight Against AIDS, Tuberculosis, and Malaria, and he will lend his expertise on the core concept of human dignity. Nika Kova. Uh, to my left, is the founding director of the 8th of March Research Institute, and she will discuss how to tackle inequality in its various forms, be a voice for marginalized communities, and push for change, adding the dimension of how mobilizing youth, which is, is extremely essential. And then also online, Ali Sulfikar Rahim, which is the GPSA program manager, is the Green Accountability Program, and World Bank Global Lead for Social Accountability and Citizen Engagement. He will talk about strategies for collaboration with civil society, governments to improve accountability at the global scale. Um, this is a joint effort. This is not just one person. This is a panel that has been co-created with members of the Global Diplomacy Lab. Dr. Vivian Valencia is the research chair and sustainable food systems and climate change. She has been a co-curator of this particular panel, Dr. Valencia. And uh, um, we also have Blair Glencourse, the executive director of the Social Accountability Lab, Global Accountability Lab. He's not here, he just had a baby, so he's uh, busy in other things <laughs> at the moment. Um, this engaging session will also facilitate collaborations between global government entities at the World Bank and civil or organizations like Accountability Lab. Um, in this particular project here, we're also going to be talking about uh, issues related to the Global Diplomacy Lab. And if you allow me, I just want to um, take here um, one element. Um, the Global Diplomacy Lab is a joint effort for developing a new, for, a new platform for global diplomacy. And it's basically the result of the collaboration between governments, foundations, and uh, different actors in civil society. 
It was initiated at the initiative of uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Germany. Now Slovenia is the second leading partner on this. And we have three foundations also leading on this. Uh, mm, Bosch Foundation, BMW Foundation, and uh, the Fulbright Commission for the Germany and, and the United States. I will also mention the following. This is not just one speaking panel. This is an initiative and a launching of, a mo of, a, of an engagement. We're trying to use this panel as a moment to initiate a discussion. We will have the opportunity of continuing with this discussion at Harvard and sometime this year or next because we would like to be able to make this particular panel a call to action, a moment in which we're going to be able to discuss and explore how we can integrate on this. It's a joint effort between different actors in different parts of the world, and we would like to be able to use this as the initial moment for this discussion. All right? So um, let's get started. And let's get started with, um, let's just say, a moment to explore what we have here in terms of the discussion with the with the social contract. Um, if we wonder a little bit about what we have in terms of the social contract, do we feel that we are in a social context in which our capacity to count on others is at its most? Has solidarity been something that is present, is something that is at its best? Sometimes we wonder. The social contract is under, under a lot of uh, strain manipulation of social media, disinformation, polarization. At all levels, we have a situation that is extremely um, complicated. It's challenging the nature of what we're doing. So um, it's important to remember that uh, the strength of one is the strength of others, and all together, this is what we count on. So let's just move forward with this discussion. And I would like to be able to start with the opportunity to facilitate an initial statement for each one of the speakers. And then a question as well, questions that relate to how the social contract is being shaped and how we're working in different parts, Slovenia, Northern Macedonia, Canada, and, other, and, and uh, at the level of the World Bank and uh, in the issues of concepts of human dignity, because we have at this point something extremely problematic and something that needs to be uh, addressed uh, promptly. Okay, so uh, let's, let's get started with this. If you allow me, um, let me just, um, sorry, here, one thing. Our dialogue today is informed by several resources, including the works by works like Human Dignity and the Future of Global Institutions by Professor and Ambassador Mark Lagon. And uh, this is one event that we should use as a clarion call for a renewed global social contract that is adaptive, resilient, and effective in meeting the complex challenges of the 21st century. Together, we can for forge a path towards a more equitable, sustainable, and just world for present and future generations. Let's start. Let me please uh, invite Ambassador Lagan, Mark Lagan. Let me ask you one question, and uh, at the same time, I will ask you to give us a bit of an introduction to the topic. How can international institutions integrate elements like human dignity and eudaimonia into the social contracts they facilitate. And yeah, it is a complex Greek term, but I'm sure you're gonna help us understand it. And at the same time, please use the time to give us your uh, overall uh, perspective on this. Well, I thank you for including me and, and for all of you at the, at the forum for your, for your interest. I share my perspective as someone who has served at the U.S. State Department um, as a, an NGO leader and in the university setting. Um, and my own interest in being lead author of a book called Human Dignity and the Future of Global, in, of Global Institutions was informed by about 20, 15, 20 years ago, seeing um, problems in policy and international organizations and how the international community were grappling with two things, human trafficking and HIV AIDS. And it led me to, to note how very different people in different parts of the political spectrum in the global north and global south were beginning to refer to human dignity. And I had this sense that the term human dignity would 
allow for a reframing of the international community um, to get away from a, a number of false debates. So in, in, the, in the book, a bunch of practitioners at Georgetown University uh, in Washington, D.C. offered um, three, three bases for human dignity that ought to guide international institutions, international institutions of two types, traditional international organizations like the UN and the World Bank, but also the modern institutions that are hybrids, multi-stakeholder uh, institutions, whether it be the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria, for which I'm a, a leading advocate in the United States, or NGOs, or modern um, multinational corporations. And those three elements are these, and they are what international organizations should concentrate on. One is people's agency, their ability to make choices uh, and apply their gifts or human flourishing. That's what uh, in ancient times was, was referred to eudaimonia, um, used by Aristotle and others. The second element of dignity is recognition, because people are not just atoms, individual, um, isolated people with rights, but they live in social contexts. And everybody craves, all human beings crave and deserve to be treated um, as having recognition. But agency and recognition in practice mean nothing unless they're institutionalized. Um, so how, how can international institutions or, or global politics um, be reoriented to emphasize human dignity? States cannot be the only actors, much as there are very um, decent and visionary individual leaders within governments. Um, and need new language. Um, and that can help break deadlocks like the old and tired debates of the North versus the South, um, the civil and political rights being separate and different from economic, um, social and cultural rights, and to have a sense, a better sense of the responsibilities of individuals, companies, and states for climate justice. Those are my initial thoughts. Thank you, Ambassador Lagon. Let me just add one little thing here, is that when we take this notion of human dignity, we all, by common sense, accept that this is integrated and is part of the daily lives and the social discourse. And yeah, human dignity, of course, of course. But if you really look into structures, it's a very common and yet absent concept in how international structures have been designed up to this point. And even at the level of democratic frameworks, uh, we all say, of course, yeah, human dignity. We have rights. We have a normative framework. But we don't have an overall encompassing principle of human dignity. And that's one of the things we're trying to push on this particular dialogue. Senator Rosa Galvez from Canada. Um, Senator, you have been an extremely uh, uh, active advocate for a civil society that engages on, on the, the challenges of today, climate change, uh, social cohesion. And I would like to mention you are one senator that has pushed for a bill that uh, opens the door for uh, climate action in a tangible way. Let me start with a question and I will ask you also to give us a bit of an intro into, into your, con your, 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 your work. How can the social contract be reframed to make climate action a non-negotiable priority? while also ensuring that vulnerable groups like indigenous people and youth with the idea of intergenerational equity are addressed. How can we just ensure that these platforms become uh, inclusive and open to all? Thank you. So first to say thank you very much to being here and for the invitation. This is a very beautiful country and I'm really sorry for what happened here. Climate um, change is a reality with extreme weather events that destroy basic infrastructure and kill people, and it's everywhere, it's systemic risk. 
So we are talking here about a social contract. I am an engineer, I'm a scientist. I'm not in political science and I have become a politician. So to, to talk about um, social contract, um, let me give you my perspective. So when we talk about the poly crisis here that we are living, the climate change, the biodiversity loss, ocean acidification, the, the wars, um, that are disrupting the society and that are causing inequalities and that uh, are causing a distrust in the democratic process. So for me, those are not causes, those are symptoms. The root causes of that, that shows that the present social contract has attained its limits, is that the model, the socioeconomical model that said that I'm going to pay my taxes, I'm going to work, and that then the government will take care of me, of my health, of my family, of my pension, that is not there anymore. The, the present social contract, which is tacit, which is not described in any, in any um, book, um, it is understood, but it must be flexible and adaptable and modernized according to the present challenge. So it starts with this paradigm, with this uh, absurdity that an infinite growth using an exploit, exploitation of, of natural resources and human slavery in the work chain is the way to go. And of course, we know now that this is a finite resource planet, that it's the same boat, we are not sitting in the same place, and that we are not addressing the causes. We are addressing the symptoms, and we are using band-aids, band-aids. And by now, we are all stick with band-aids, but we are not addressing the causes. And the cause is that this economic model that says it's linear, that says take all natural resources, put it in a manufactured chain, create products, and then waste. So science and engineering are telling us that more than 60% of what is extracted from the planet ends at a various time, some things vary in almost seconds. Take, for example, a candy that you open it and just the plastic, you throw it. So for some products, it become a waste in seconds. For others, it become a waste in months, in years. But 60% end up in landfills, end up in uh, the plastic patch in the, that is floating in the Pacific. Microplastics are found today in blood, in the placenta. So this, and it's called an externality by the corporations. And this externality has not been solved. And until we don't redress this issue, this issue with our economic model and redress to a sustainable development, circular economy, we will just put in band-aids to the problem. So what are the solutions? Because the question was, what is the solution? So dignity is, is the word, is the key word, is the, is the point of entry. So what is dignity? So we have to go back to live in harmony with our planet. So, on, but on one hand, some people in the world, in the global north, they have access to healthcare, to justice, to food, to education, to opportunities, to democracy. But in the global south, they don't have yet all of this. So they need to develop. And so that is, for me, with dignity. That's the dignity. We have to have everybody to be recognized, to have the right to vote, to have the right to an education, to health, to justice. And that is the floor that everybody, every single human being should have access to that. But there is a roof, there is a limit, and that limit is imposed by the planetary boundaries that tell us that you cannot just keep 
extracting exploiting in a linear and wasting. So we cannot do in this transition, in this decarbonization, we cannot just do the same, the colonization, and go and go after critical minerals. And I'm an engineer. So let me tell you that I do understand extractivism. But we cannot just go in the same way, using the same approach, because we will continue in the exploitation of indigenous people stepping in their, in their, in their lands, which by now we should know that 80% of the biodiversity that is remaining in the planet and that we need it is in the hands of indigenous people. So we cannot destroy that. So between the floor of basic needs and recognition and dignity and the roof of planetary boundaries, we have to find humans our way of thriving and have a circular economic sustainable model that will allow us to live in harmony with nature. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Nicola. We had a few discussions before, and uh, it was extremely interesting to see how you have taken your work as a politician, as a social mobilizer, and you created this NGO, and you focus so much on the idea of accountability. And we, we discuss how this accountability connects with the notion of, of the social contract, how it's important, especially the role of youth. One of the questions uh, I would really like to, 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 to have your views on is, how can actionable initiatives and innovative platforms be used to modernize the social contract and engage youth, to make youth something, uh, an active partner in the social contract? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Diego, for the question. And I'm very pleased to be on this panel uh, with this dis distinguished, inspiring speakers around me. Nika uh, next to me. I think we have, a, we have to learn from the Slovenian yeah. experience on, on mobilizing people. Now, briefly, um, I'm, my story is I'm a diplomat. Uh, I started when I was 23. I served in Washington, yeah. in the Netherlands, Brussels, and many other places. And I was under the impression that fixing the big framework will help me, uh, will help the country being fixed. We join NATO, mm. we become part of the European Union. Mm. And that's somehow how we're gonna become a country that is a strong democracy where human rights are cherished, where health system functions, uh, education is good, there is social <laughs> justice, uh, politicians are held to account. Now, in these last years, in part because uh, some things we did, we joined NATO, but I've come to realize that um, change comes from home. And the frameworks can help. The European accession process is a process that is supposed to transform societies. But unless there is a force in our domestic society that pushes in the right direction, yeah. change will not happen. Yeah. So the accession process is useful, very important, but not sufficient to help us cross this line of certainty as a nation. And uh, I was an accidental politician, not having a party affiliation. So I joined as an activist. Mm -hmm. I was working in a think tank in the Netherlands. We had hopeful times. They asked me to, to come back. I, I, I came back and, we, and I helped solve one of the biggest issues of the country, which was at that time with Greece. Now we have a different one yeah. with, with another neighbor, Bulgaria. Mm -hmm. So um, this last couple of years, we started an NGO. And our first project is essentially built a citizen's force by identifying all the islands of integrity we have in our society. Uh, and we have uh, some union representatives. Uh, one major success in this fight for a better society, for a better system, was won by the union of the flight controllers. Mm -hmm. 
um, where the political leadership of the Civil Aviation Authority went to annul a competition to get young flight controllers because the party lists were not happy. Wow. The candidates who were backed by political parties were not accepted because the selection was done by a Danish institution. So the union said, look, if you do this, we can all resign. We will all quit. And there won't be flights in the Macedonian skies. And of course, they won the battle. In, in a society like ours, and I think we share this with some other countries in the region, um, political parties are not only about policies, they're also about employment. Mm. So they give jobs to their supporters to get their support. They give important political positions, directors of public companies, etc., to their more important friends and, and supporters. When you do this over time, you cripple institutions. Because if teachers depend on party political backing, then you don't end up with the best teachers, but with the most loyal party supporters. And same applies to judges, to public prosecutors, to medical professionals. The flight controllers. <laughs> so um, I believe that politics and democracy is too important to be left only to political parties. They are important, but citizens are more important. And I believe in a democracy based on a concept of engaged citizens. And our premise is that when a group of individual, committed individuals is focused and organized, we can make a difference. So our modus operandi is, uh, I mentioned this example of the union, grassroots political movements, civil society organizations. We have one in the eastern part of the country dealing with social justice, representing workers before the courts. Uh, we try to uh, create a network where we help each other mm. based on a lowest common denominator, green movements as well. Mm. Uh, and trying to build a force in the society that will not be easily ignored by the decision makers. Plus, cooperation with the media. We need the professional uh, journalists and, and the media as well. So uh, we launched a website and we have uh, many categories, but two I will mention. One is our heroes. Whenever we see and identify an individual that creates value, that is successful, whether it's in the field of the environment, or activism, or science, or business, we try to provide a platform and visibility. Because we believe that when the overwhelming energy in the society is apathy and defeatism, when people lose agency, and when the belief is we cannot make a difference, yeah. we cannot change this, this is not a good environment. The environment has to be, we can do this. We can make a difference. So we promote visibly these positive examples. We also have uh, an option for citizens to come and complain when they have an issue in their local community, at the national level. We try to support whether legal help, but also promote, give visibility to, to that problem. And we try to enrich the public debate, which often is reduced to an exchange of insults between political players. You still, you're corrupt, and the answer is, but you're, you're still more, you're more corrupt. And this debate is not healthy, and it doesn't lead to a meaningful result. And that's why we titled, we titled the NGO Solution, because we have to have a debate about a problem, but also about how to solve it. Yeah. And we can look for inspiration in countries such as Slovenia. We shared one big federation uh, with Slovenia. From our perspective, I'm, no, I'm, I'm sure that Slovenia is not perfect, but from the perspective of my country, uh, Macedonia, North Macedonia, we, can, we have a lot to learn from Slovenia. So why don't we see how they solved some of the problems that we shared uh, with them? So. Uh, 
this is, uh, in brief, I think this is a very diverse panel, but I think it's helpful to come with the perspective of a country or, or a region where things are not going well, where the social contract is actually failing, where judges do not uh, deliver justice, where hospitals do not deliver proper health care, and where schools do not deliver, deliver proper education, and where it's too important to be backed and to have friends in important places. This we have to challenge and fix. Because the youth is trying to live and... Uh, yes, we, we don't have much time. We are in a race uh, with time because for our youth, uh, it's easier to have a European way of life in a different country in Europe. Yeah. So we lose individuals and families to Germany, to Slovenia, to some extent as well. So I think it is the duty of my generation, which is sort of the transitional generation, to make sure that they have a good start at home yeah. and that they have a perspective for a European way of life with dignity at home. Because if we don't have a functionable and, and functioning social contract, we lose the social capital and we lose the human capital. That's indeed an important thing. I just wanted to uh, also mention that it's interesting when you take on an interdisciplinary approach, you are looking at those, as you mentioned, islands of, uh, of, uh, of good governance and capacity and honesty. Uh, one of the co-designers uh, of the panel, Blair Glancourt, has this phrase in his uh, Global Accountability Lab, less fame and not shame. He actually tries to focus and put the emphasis on the positive deviance of the color in ecology, the good things that work and see how can we make more of that working as well. Um, okay, Nika, um, in our discussions, we, 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 we talk about how these different elements of, of supporting the youth and enabling the youth to work, and you have a unique record. I mean, you have a very successful record on facilitating things and how you have been able to achieve so many things in Slovenia. I mean, uh, uh, Nicola just mentioned that they take a lot of your actions as an example. So please tell us a little bit in terms of your, your perspective and your, your approach. How do you see the role of digital platforms, social media, different tools? How do you see those as instruments and the power of networking to mobilize youth for social change? And please also tell us about your work and everything you've done so far. Okay, uh, hi from my side also. Um, I'm Nika, I'm coming from the organization called Institute 8 of March. In last two years, we led two big national referendum campaigns, one big go out and vote campaign. Um, we have uh, membership groups in almost every single city, and until now, we didn't lose a single campaign. Um, how and why? I think that firstly, because we never thought about us as, a, as the youth. We thought about us as the as the group of engaged people who want to change something. And uh, secondly, we never um, think that um, there is a huge division between the people in Slovenia. Um, in last two years, we visited almost every city, talked with hundreds of people, and one thing which we realized is that between the people there is like a social contract. A social contract that every single person deserves a dignifying life, a social contract that we need to respect each other, and a social contract that we want to live in peace. And um, when we realized this, we started to open topics and lead campaigns which are really content-based um, and include like different voices in this. Um, I think that every political party or every NGO who thinks about engaging youth with a particular form, like with a particular tool, is failing um, because um, youth is interested in content. And the biggest mistake that um, people are doing is that they're thinking that there needs to be something cool or sexy or something new to engage the youth. Usually it is cringe, usually it is boring, usually we don't buy it. We buy content and we buy real arguments. Um, one of my favorite campaigns which we did in the Institute 8 of March was a campaign to change the definition of law about rape in Slovenia. The campaign happened under 
other government, under the right-wing government. Um, we um, collected testimonies of sexual harassment uh, from different people in Slovenia, and we realized that law needs to be changed. And all the people said to us, don't try this under the right-wing government, you will fail. Um, but we are really stubborn. And we said we will include the voices of women with that kind of experiences. And we will make clear that it's not the thing about the parties, it's the thing about protection of human beings. At the end, the law was accepted in the National Assembly and our methodology was framed. So basically working to push different campaigns, to different contents um, through parliament, making politicians a little bit afraid in a nice way and uh, forcing them to um, actually um, do things uh, which are good to the people. But also whenever they give you the hand, uh, speak really nicely about them. We take photos with politicians. We say thank you because we need the changes possible when we all stand together. And you challenge that somehow interesting stereotype saying that to speak to the youth, you have to take on a different approach and kind of be cool. No, you say we want content. We are concerned about the future, right? Yeah, and also, like, I think that we always get annoyed, that, like, when people say, like, oh, this is the youth organization of Slovenia. Yes, we are mostly young, but most of our volunteers are in two age groups. The first one is, like, volunteers between 18 till 30, 35, and the second one are volunteers between 70 and 85. These are the people who have time and they work perfectly together. We also have parties where we party together. Um, and I think that the future of the change is not in the youth, but it's in the intersection of uh, youth and elderly who are willing to devote time to change. A proactive and, 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 and vivacious social contract in many ways. Um, Janos, thank you. Janos, um, uh, you have an interesting experience, government, business, different frameworks. And you wanted to put the emphasis on one specific tool that illustrates mechanisms of the social contract, vitality and accountability. How, could you discuss how telemedicine, one of your areas of expertise, and other technological solutions can help governments fulfill the healthcare commitments under the social contract? How technology be an instrument for the vitalization and the support and the, the essence of the social country. Thank you, Diego. Before you have to. Thank you, Diego. Before I um, start answering your question, I would like to express my sincere apologies for being late. I have a very unfortunate reason for that. I ran into a medical emergency while stepping out of the hotel. Okay. And since I'm uh, trade, uh, trained as a physician, I. I, I had to stay there, not necessarily for helping, because it turned out positively, but uh, for waiting until the emergency um, arrives. And then that was the reason why I was substantially late. I dropped you a note, but then you were uh, already on the panel. Um, so apologies. Um, uh, the, as far as your question is concerned, uh, this Medicine and and healthcare may not be the um, the may, may not seem to fit very well to the to, to the topic, but let me explain why it is because uh, this is another element of the from the bottom of the Maslow pyramid, yeah. uh, and uh, we have to tackle this. Um, uh, one of the uh, most blatant dishonesties of the modern politics is that in theory it is offering uh, free and uh, universal access to quality medicine all around the world, particularly in Central Eastern Europe. This is usually stated in the constitutions of the countries, which is, which is, which is a lie. Because we all know that access is not universal and the healthcare is not a quality healthcare, especially not in the least wealthy nations, such as some of the Eastern European ones, for multiple reasons. Because of the polycrisis that we are undergoing, because of the um, shortage of doctors, other medical professionals, because of the shortage of infrastructure, shortage of money, lots of uh, other things. 
But still, the notion of free and universal healthcare is there in the law. Uh, and uh, I, I, I think we have to admit that this, will, uh, this promise will never be met under the current circumstances. And we, as global citizens, uh, we as the ones equipped with the knowledge how to overcome issues like this, we have to find the solutions uh, for this. And in my view, a big part of the solution is technology. Technology because the access, bridging distances, bridging shortage of doctors, delivering healthcare to populations who will never have access to uh, regularly organized healthcare services. We have, for example, four million gypsies in this southeastern European and Central Eastern European region. These people will never have access to traditionally organized services because there is no organization, there is no business model, there is no funding which would bring them this feature of the 21st century. Therefore, we have to invent new ways. Uh, we have to reach out to them. We have to bridge distances. We have to use telemedicine. We have to use teleconsultation, telemonitoring, telediagnostics. In the future, we also have to use robotics to tackle their issues. Let me give you examples, uh, very recent examples. When in the uh, COVID times, the previous, the immediate previous crisis before the uh, Russian aggression in Ukraine was that the Ukrainian-Hungarian border was shut down. And tens of thousands of people, Hungarians, minority Hungarians living abroad in Ukraine, uh, ceased to have access to uh, medical services because they traditionally went to Hungary for medicines to see doctors, etc. We had a couple of days merely to uh, set up a telemedical system which would give them access. The other example is COVID in Hungary, where as a result of COVID, we had to shut down um, hospital departments, sometimes entire hospitals. But at the same time, we were obliged to service tens of thousands of people with chronic illnesses. So if you don't die from COVID, then you will die from your chronic um, uh, disease unless you get the treatment. And uh, we had a week or less than that to set up telemedicine solutions to uh, serve, for example, 10,000 uh, children with uh, uh, chronic uh, pulmonary uh, illnesses. Uh, these are good examples how, how, how we can, uh, we can over, overcome this. Uh, telemedicine is distant tolerant, distance tolerant, Telemedicine can uh, service uh, much more people with the same number of uh, medical service providers. Therefore, I think this is one of the mm. one of the fields where technology, embracing technology of the 21st century, digitization, and all the things that we are we have been talking about in other industries such as banking, fintech, and others. So bringing them into the play for Haska will definitely change uh, the playing field here for the good of uh, the people. Thank you very much. And, and as you can observe, from different angles, technology enable us to be in a different situation. So it is the 21st century. We have tools, and the problems we have are related to willingness and leadership. You know, somebody mentioned in a previous panel, poverty today at this time and age is not because of lack of resources, it's because it's a political choice. And the same applies to all these different elements related to the essence of the social contract. We have the tools, we have the principles, we have the blueprints. If they are not working, it's not because we need better ideas, it's probably because we need a better disposition and better leadership to make it work. And that's certainly one thing that we have to keep in mind. And you observe as well that we're taking a very broad angle in terms of different examples, but they all relate to one thing, is how our social contract can be the glue and the enabler that facilitates this new change and is something important for all of us. Now, let me take it back to Ali, which is in Washington as well. Um, Ali Sulfikar, World Bank, is very much 
involved in doing a lot of things for their accountability. Accountability and how accountability connects with climate issues, with green accountability. Ali, could you please explain to us and tell us a little bit about how green accountability be operationalized within climate finance frameworks to engage the private sector and civil society? And on a larger level, how this whole concept of green accountability can be a vector and enabler for civil society to play the role that it has to play in the pursuit of this whole approach towards social change, determined and shaped by the idea of human dignity. Over to you, Ali. Great, can you hear me, Diego? Well done, thank, cheers. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you for having us again. Um, wonderful to be with this distinguished panel. And, uh, and thanks to the Bled Forum, I uh, wish I could be there as well. But Diego, as you said, this is a series of events and I'm flying to Estonia uh, this, this weekend and, and this will continue at the Open Government Summit there. And so I think, you know, we need to get topics like this uh, on the global agenda increasingly. You know, and I think that the key point you were making here was we are in need of a global social contract. And, you know, when you look at the Bretton Woods institutions, you look at the UN system, you know, these were systems birthed out of a conflagration of, of the last century. And we're on the cusp of a, of a new conflagration. You know, our planet is burning. And to solve that problem today, we need new ways of thinking. We need new ways of understanding the power of human dignity, not just for its normative value, but because there is no pathway to net zero without building human dignity into the new global system. And that word system is actually, I think, critical because we need systems oriented thinking to understand the intersection from what happens locally in a vertically, vertical, vertically integrated chain to what's happening globally. Uh, and increasingly, the collective action we need to pursue as nations, as international financial institutions, as private sector investors, rely deeply on what's happening at the level of a local village where you need the local knowledge to know where you're going to plant the tree in the Amazon to make sure it flourishes for the next 100 years and you restore the biome we need to sequester our carbon. So I think that systemic thinking is missing. And the kind of systemic thinking we need around people is often seen as a non-technical area or it's seen as a risk mitigation approach. So I think the reorientation we need to take and what we're trying to do with our Green Accountability Initiative at the Global Partnership for Social Accountability is to, to have people understand that this is also a very technical area of work. And it goes to the heart of the technical solutions we need to combat climate change. You will not get to the carbon sequestration goals you're setting unless you build truly transparent, participatory, and accountable systems for delivering those solutions to identifying the needs and targeting to bringing people into the daily oversight of the delivery of those solutions. That requires resources. That requires coordination at multiple levels of the international system, let alone at the subnational level. And it requires new norms and standards to ensure we can build those systems. And it involves technologies. Uh, you know, on technology, I think the point, uh, uh, you know, um, we just heard from Janos are, are quite important because, you know, the challenge is so far flung that we need to enable participatory technologies to allow us to engage in new ways and to understand that what the voices of people tell us is data. Uh, we're also not currently leveraging feedback people systemically as data. Uh, Information is being used as data when we're selling tacos using Google search analytics. It's not effectively to target uh, optimization of policy delivery. The technology is here today. We use things that are much less critical than the global challenges we actually need to solve. Why aren't we applying this to, why are we applying this ad target metrics, but not service delivery optimization group? So, you know, there's a lot of reasons why this at global system. When we launched the Green Accountability Initiative a year ago, we saw this gap along the This is a building uh, conversations with the summit. We held a conference on the Ali, Ali, house. Ali, if I may, if I may, Coming Ali, to Ali, Ali uh, yeah. can, you, can you speak slower so that the data loss is bridged? 
if you if you user if you go like this, then the oh. data loss is overcome. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. So uh, where I was was that we, we have a coalition forming around this. The accountability initiative we we launched is a programmatic platform to bring uh, both global act. Is it, is it still breaking up? Okay. Yeah, cut, cut the video actually, Ali, for a moment. Maybe that helps. Sure. Yeah. How's that? Is that better? Yeah, we gain. Thank you. Okay. So the, the green accountability platform we've launched, Diego, is uh, going to be together for uh, uh, building country system to involve citizens and civil society organizations in climate finance with global learning and coordination around the kind of systems and around them. We have examples that we've already started uh, nearby in the neighborhood. We have a, a prior initiative started in Kosovo, European, where uh, Open uh, Data Kosovo and Green Foundation are working to develop a participatory system to help citizens in, in climate finance decision making and influence that the will be doing, and to have that brokerage and so that people can have an active on determining where climate finance goes. I guess let me by saying need to think of citizen engagement and the new global contract this oriented way. We need to the DNA of the renewal of the global architecture we're going to bring up climate finance. These discussions are very active. Part of the discussion probably the most underdeveloped yeah. and I uh, Ali, really Ali, as the, as they say in this uh, BBC sitcom, uh, turn it off and reset. <laughs> if you can just disconnect and connect again, then probably gonna be able to have a better connection with you because we lost important parts of your of your last uh, moment. So I will make sure you have a moment to to go back on that. But uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, if you can just disconnect and come back on the link, that probably is going to give us a new launch on, on the data feed, OK? OK, sounds good. Thank you. All right. Um, so, Senator, Senator Galvez, um, you have done a lot in teaching, research, uh, all this. But certainly, this is, this is a lame motive in all this about you know, empowering youth, facilitating engagement. Uh, how can we empower civil society and community sectors to hold the government accountable for climate commitments? And the natural question is, yeah, vote. Yeah, but more than that, I mean, how can we just make it happen for real? Thank you. Thank you for the question. It's very important. And uh, because you miss some part of what Ali was saying, maybe I will um, talk about the economy. But first, first, before that, and the finance world. Before that, yes, of course, education. We don't study in primary school, neither in high school, about democracy, about voting, about our role in the democracy. We, we have to. Another issue is that uh, politicians, you know, when you look into who is trusted in society, well, doctors are first, and then, you know, scientists, and then at the end are the bankers and the politicians. So that tells a lot of the what uh, uh, society thinks about that. Um, but there are ways, and uh, I, I am chair of a network on climate change and sustainability for a friendship, uh, parliamentarian friendship called Parlamericas. And in there, we develop um, and we encourage and promote the adoption of open parliaments in every parliament in the Americas. Open parliament is very important. And Ali was just discussing about an open government, open parliament uh, forum in Estonia. Uh, and what is this open <laughs> parliament, open government? You know, it usually encompasses four pillars. First, transparency, transparency. So in Canada, every vote, every dollar that I use, it's public, it is presented to the population, they know. Um, and every three months, every three months, there is a, uh, in the website uh, a place where you can see how I have used every single uh, tax dollar 
um, Canadian tax dollar paying money. Another one is about accountability. So the, the important thing too is that in this, part, whether it's a republic or whether it's a, a, like a commonwealth country and uh, following the Wastemaster um, uh, model, you know, still you have a table where there are four or three legs and each one checks, it does the check and balance. And you talk about judges that uh, don't, don't deliver justice. And, and living in Latin America, I, I know about that. And we, um, and we need to redress this situation. So accountability. Each of these um, institutions needs to do the proper accountability. Other, otherwise, it could be considered a direction of duty. They are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. But the, the most <laughs> important one, and it, that is taking in um, such a big role in this issue with the new social contract is the citizen participation. So citizen participation is at the level of uh, proposing legislations. And I have seen some examples in Latin America where the citizen, and or like Mika mentioned, you know that citizens can present legislations and doesn't need to be presented from one party or another party. But also what is important in open parliaments is the high standards and ethics of politicians. So for example, in Canada, we have had seven ex scandals and we cannot impeach somebody. We have to apply peer pressure, you know, peer pressure. And that peer pressure is even sometimes in the public. So to put the pressure so somebody will resign by themselves because of the scandal, and you just need to Google somebody in the Canadian parliament was a sexual harasser for more than 15 years. And he was not impeached. He was not uh, pushed away from, from the parliament. It was the peer pressure and the public and the publicity, the media, that made this, this possible. But um, talking about just a little bit on the financial, because this is important. So I said that the economic model is not working. And when we look at this decarbonization and this transition, we see that the science has been there for the last 20 years. As a scientist, we are saying we are unequivocally um, knowledge that is the human activity. But we haven't said the cause, the combustion of fossil fuels. We, I've been here three days and we haven't mentioned one single time fossil fuels or a, a, a specific company. Yet, attribution science has said, for example, in, 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 in Canada, that the forest fires can be traced down to a five companies that has been depleting groundwater. So like the trees has a less humidity and they, so they are dry wood. And so the, temper, the temperatures at which now the wild forests are burning is very high. So we are not talking about the number of wildfires being different. What we are talking about is that the extension, the surface is, is larger. We are talking about that the humidity in the trees are lower. And we are talking about that the, uh, they are getting closer and closer to cities. We have evacuated three times a city near the oil sands. How many times do we need to evacuate this city? until we learn that it is not any more logic and rational to, to live there. So which are these financial sector? Yeah. The banks, the pension plans, very important in Canada, and the, um, um, and the insurance companies. So in Canada, exactly like in California, insurance very soon are not going to insure houses. We had a we had a, in uh, British Columbia, we have an atmospheric river carrying the whole water of the Mississippi River, inundating and flooding an incredible huge area. This is almost one year ago, and there are still people living in hotels. Yeah. So the science is there, and it has been there for a while. The technology is there, solar, wind, hydroelectric, uh, nuclear, and even now 
or um, how you call wave and tide. Opinion in Canada is 72% of people are in favor of a stronger answer to climate change. Who is missing? I sponsor Net Zero 2050 bill. I sponsor it. It's going to be two years ago now. But that is a plan to do a plan. So now, because I was fed up, I <coughs> put a bill which is aligning the commitments on climate change that we have and that Canada have not attained any of our climate commitments, align what we said we are going to do, which is the worst, with what is missing, which is the contribution of the financial sector. So maybe you are aware of this term called double materiality. The financial sector is put in a position with double materiality, meaning on one hand, they see all this destruction of all this basic infrastructure. Most of the time, they had not been paid completely. So who's going to pay after this destruction and the reconstruction? So this is very scary. So they are talking about disclosing the climate risk on one side. But at the same time, this same financial sector, they turn around and they fuel the climate crisis because they are keep <coughs> fueling the companies that put that greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Mm. So my bill tries to reconciliate and bring actions to the worst. Thank you very much. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's about taking leadership, taking a stance, being open and transparent and uh, accepting, you know, the, the shortcomings and also see what, what else can be done. I mean, I hope one day we might have crowdsourced crowdsource bills jointly sponsored by parliamentarians, senators, and civil society actors. You know, that might be one thing that can be put out there. Nika, let's learn from success. Let's learn from the positive deviance here. Uh, tell us a little bit about specific content strategies or campaigns. Tell us about what is the magic sauce that you have. Uh, and what would be your recommendation to engage young people not just through modern platforms, but through any platforms. I mean, how can we have this impact with youth people next year, that they have the next session on the Blade Forum? And if, is that the thing to do? Or what else should we do? Uh, I think that, like, I always say when I visit other countries that, like, it's not, like, just the magic sauce. It's also, like, some circumstances which are making our fight easier. First is the scale of Slovenia. Uh, when I talk with my friends in Hungary, I always say, like, it's totally different. Um, in Slovenia, you can drive from one part of the country to another in one day, and you literally don't have the excuse not to visit everyone. Um, but I think that some of the things which, are, we, which we are doing are, like, new, in a sense. And this is that we believe in... Um, in a fact that we cannot win the campaign alone. Actually, whenever we do a referendum or a campaign, we think we will lose because we always say we are just like a group of 15 young people who tries really hard to do something, but if others won't be engaged, nothing will happen. So in every single campaign, we give people tools um, and ask them to do their own campaign. Um, for example, when we did the referendum um, about water, we asked people to write letters to the neighbors um, and ask them to come to the referendum. Um, sometimes we ask the people to bake cakes and write a slogan of the campaign on the cake because when they share cake with eight people, they will speak about the campaign with eight people, and this is something. Um, we always believe that whatever someone can do, it's enough, and it's a huge contribution. If someone just shares a post, we will really appreciate it. Um, we also always engage artists and um, um, illustrators to do their own campaigns. And even sometimes, like it usually happens that some people have a little bit strange ideas. We always say, say do your own idea, try it, test it, 
um, do your own campaign. And the first time when I knew that we did something well was with our first referendum, where people were stopping me on the street at the beginning, saying, um, we support what you are doing, but you will lose. And like one week before the referendum, people started to come and say, we will win. We will win together. So um, I also think that one thing which we always try is to say this is not the victory of the institute. This is a common victory of all the people who participated. Another practice which we are doing and which is also new is that we are an organization which came out of the Me Too movement. So we were basically like the first group in Slovenia who started to speak about um, Me Too testimonies. And we opened a formula on the web page to ask the people to share their experiences with sexual harassment. And we realized that people love to speak about their experiences. And that when we speak about the experiences, we can understand the other side. So in every campaign that we do, um, we use this model. We always ask people to share the experiences. We are good friends with a group of improvisers because Tanya from my team, who is also here, like she's uh, a, an improviser. So we organize readings in different cities of those testimonies. And we always try to show what is the re relationship between individual experience and systemic change. Because this is something really abstract and um, we managed to discover a way how to show it. And also, like one huge part of what we do is that we try to have a lot of fun. Uh, whenever it's like really shitty, we use a dark sense of humor, we laugh a lot, and we always remind each other that people who work with us are volunteers. They are not paid. They are doing this instead of watching television, reading, being outside, and we always need to take care of the people. So basically, we also organize picnics and parties, and um, we always say, even if it is really dark, like in the campaign in one moment, find something small to celebrate, to find like sources of joy. And this is how we do it. Oh, and we don't, like we are not afraid of authorities. Like um, if we speak <laughs> with a member of parliament, if we speak with uh, ministers, with anyone, like we have the same attitude yeah. as when we speak with volunteers. Horizontal level, equal yeah. to equal. Which is, um, yeah. let me just spin it there, so fantastic. <laughs> I just just spin it there because it's one of the key elements of the concept of human dignity is the recognition. I see you, you see me. Let's work together, same level. Yeah. That's that's an important element. Um, uh, let me just take a quite a small pause here and just mention something just in case we run out of time. That as I mentioned at the beginning, this is not just a panel. We would like to engage and carry on. Uh, there are some QR codes at the at the entrance over there because the idea of this project was to have the discussion engage on an article, potentially an op-ed, and see how else we could carry on with this initiative. And so I mentioned the possibility of having something in North America, but also the possibility of co-writing, co-authoring, collaborating, all co-something. -co let's, let's see if you do it. So if you're interested, uh, check on the QR, a great use of technology. By the way, uh, <laughs> Janus has a lot of knowledge about this industry itself, he's quite involved in that. And uh, with those QRs, we will be part of the same team, okay? So let's uh, try to continue here. Um, I will ask Ambassador Lagon, Mark, um, yes, we have a question in the script, but just give us the strong pitch for this human dignity because we want to make sure that it permeates on everything we're going to be doing here. How can the concept of social recognition be both quantified and ethically managed within social dialogues to promote human dignity? How can we make it count so that for bureaucrats like me, for people that have to transform it into budgets, this human dignity becomes operational? And once we do that, why is it so important to have this idea, this rule of thumb, this central principle at the center of what we're trying to do with the social contract? Well, thanks for asking. And it's important for us to be concrete. We're talking about a lot of factors and a holistic approach, but it's very important not to, you know, say everything is important and then nothing is important. So we are, my fellow panelists are really concentrating on the things that matter. Social recognition, is both important as a means for achieving human dignity, but also defining the end. Uh, we need to we need to measure ways that um, human dignity as an end is not being robbed. Um, 
effects on, you know, for instance, the survivors um, of persecution, uh, of atrocities, of um, climate displacement, of human trafficking. Um, but we also need to try and measure the value that um, is offered by uh, others. I think if we could quantify, uh, uh, let me cite someone else. I used to be the U.S. ambassador to combat trafficking in persons at the State Department. A scholar in the field on human trafficking, Kevin Bales, wrote one of the first really striking books maybe 22 years ago. And the book on human trafficking is called Disposable People. And he didn't just focus on the horrible exploitation of sex trafficking and labor trafficking victims. Um, but he tried to quantify the wasted value of people who could be flourishing if they were only recognized as equal beings and not migrants or uh, minorities or disposable commodified um, slaves. So I think those things are important. Um, I'll end with, with something my own organization is doing. There's We're a global health organization. It's so nice to participate with Yanis and others. Um, UN General Assembly meeting on September 20th on pandemic preparedness. And my organization has put out a report on how pandemic preparedness is not just surveillance and laboratories and, and such, but it must be people-centered. It must think about the people who, who need access to healthcare in a, in a healthcare emergency. It must think about reaching remote people or stigmatized people or marginalized people. Um, it must equip community health workers who are paid little or nothing in, uh, to, to reach the people um, who, who need um, help in pandemics. Um, and I think that's that's the kind of thing we need to figure out how to measure uh, to have true impact for human dignity through social recognition. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I'm gonna take an executive decision and I'm gonna jump onto the next stage. And I will ask each of the panelists to share with us either a wish, a tool, or a measure, or one change that you would like to focus on in your work and the work that you see here. And uh, to do it in such a way that we connect it with, with the topic we are about human dignity, but in a way that integrates with what we're trying to aim, which is uh, how can we just make things better, okay? And uh, I will start with Ali and give you a moment as well to pick up on, on the stuff and let's, let's just hope that the IT crowd <laughs> doesn't come again. Okay, over to you, Ali. Mute, mute. No. No. Uh, okay, so we have to fix that part, but we don't hear you at the moment. Um, let's see. Right, in that case, uh, Nicola. Yes, a wish, you said, right? Yeah, a wish, a measure, or a change. I mean, if you have the magic wand. So, yes. I dream of active citizens. I think it's time we assume the responsibility of the collective good. Uh, Nika inspired me with these examples. We are we're going to start a campaign on in coalition with young doctors and young lawyers right. to change a law, legislation, that gives too broad of a discretionary, discretionary power to managers of public hospitals. So we have a good selection process, ranked candidates, but they can employ anyone. Mm. And we start from the health sector because I think it's the most obvious that people want to go to a good doctor yeah. and not to a doctor from this political party or that political party. So my wish is that this is a stunning success and then this uh, is sort of the 
the example that will be used in all the other areas so that we have equal opportunities in our Fantastic. system. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Janusz. So before COVID, we had been lobbying on every single level in the Hungarian parliament and government to accept the legislation which accepts a telemedicine session legally similarly to how a physical meeting between the doctor and the patient is being accepted. We have had been lobbying for two years without any success. In the COVID time, the legislation passed through within five business days because politics is only understanding coercion, uh, compulsion. Um, how can we enforce this? How can we create an environment artificially? I would call the um, famous uh, format of Global Diplomacy Lab, uh, which is the Situation Room, to, to talk about this. How can we use this? How can we create a coercive environment to, um, to, to coerce politicians to make the decisions, having heard about the sad example of the senator, uh, how she has been dealing with another important issue uh, and um, we all are suffering from the legislation lagging so drastically behind the common sense. So my wish, my measure, my whatever, is to, to, to influence legislation in a good way. Thank you. Thank you very much. Senator Diego, I tried to join on uh, a cellular. Tell yeah. me if it's better. Okay, Ali, I, go ahead. <clears throat> go ahead. You never know, you know. Seize the moment. So go ahead. <laughs> Carpe diem. Please tell us so, your wish. I, you know, I, I think I need to put a wish out there on uh, enabling technology so, uh, so, you know, we can have global engagements more effectively. But, um, Diego, is it working? It is working. It is working. Okay. All right. Very good. Amen. So, look, I, I, I think uh, the wish I'd put out there is around um, the global climate discussions and the global climate finance discussions that are picking up is that we think of how we enable resource and institutionalize the support to direct engagement of people, the technology enabling of that, the institutional setup we need in the, uh, in the international finance and development system to ensure that as we drive towards climate goals, we are building this essential element in, both for the end of dignity that Mark spoke about, but also so we can get to the outcomes we need. Um, I think uh, the wish is that you know those here who have uh, those kinds of networks and, uh, and as we're influencing the change of these institutions, and there's an active change process underway in many institutions, is that we try to frame very substantially the type of resources, technical support, and systems that people and their organizations, civil society, uh, are going to need to be part of the effective delivery of, of the, the greatest challenge um, humanity has faced, uh, perhaps ever. Thank you, Ali. Thank you very much. Senator, let's just finish. Yes, with thank you. So, yeah, my wish is that everybody understands that uh, um, there is no economy and there is no society without uh, protection and uh, uh, safeguard of environment and to realize that for every dollar that we put in the protection of the environment, the ecological services benefits that we receive in return are 30. So that's the economical argument for protecting our environment. Placing the value on humans is probably a good business decision. It should be. Nina. Yeah, uh, Nika. Nika, sorry. Okay, so um, like if I could have one wish regarding the work which we do is basically to establish an international library of best practices about campaigning because I think that so often we are in different countries, each on our own, discovering and repeating each other's mistakes. And if there would be a chance to like bring all the knowledge together and just fake the best practices, it would be really easier for a lot of us. Yeah, and when I listen to you, I remember all these practices, all these campaigns from the Obama time and how these were reproduced. I guess, yeah, if we have this global library, we just have a global uh, common knowledge and how we make it happen. Final words to Ambassador Lagon. One last wish, and then I will give you my last wish. 
and we have to really go quickly. <laughs> Ambassador? Okay, well, I think it's just don't forget the lessons of the past, whether it's slavery in the United States or how nationalism and othering led to fascism in Europe, and that could be have application in the United States or India or many other places. But in particular, with respect to civil society, we learned from the, the process of creating the, the sustainable development goals that um, the UN as an intergovernmental organization benefited from fully engaging civil society in dialogue to create the 2030 uh, goals back in 2015. And that they civil society was should be part of measuring, um, but we forget things. Uh, the world has created a new pandemic preparedness fund uh, hosted by the World Bank, and it seems to have forgotten the lessons of things like the Global Fund, that you need to include civil society as part of multi-stakeholder institutions. The World Bank's pandemic fund um, at first was only going to have donor countries on its board, and then they thought to maybe have implementing countries of the South also. Ultimately, people had to fight for two seats on the board of this pandemic fund at the World Bank for civil society. And only one of them is a seat for civil society of the global South. That's forgetting lessons of the past. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Ambassador. You. Um, and my wish is that this is the beginning of something that helps us have the global library that will link up your institution with uh, our colleague Blair, and that we have the Global Accountability Lab collaborating with your institution solutions. Hopefully, those will be too tangible. That we get to have a better approach to technology and be able to embrace it so that it becomes the instrument that it's supposed to be for uh, invasive dialogue. That we have a more concrete and more coherent social dialogue that really places the value where it has to be. And that democracy delivers for all of us. And that Ali, um, will have a better internet connection, but on top of that, that Ali will be able to achieve what he's set to do, which is having this green accountability mechanism that is going to really transform the way civil society is going to have the finger, the pulse, and an eye on what is being done on climate change. So really, Godspeed on that one. And to all of you, thank you so much for your participation. Remember the QR codes, they are there. Uh, this is the beginning of something. Please stay with us. We will be hopefully being able to take this on to the next level, next discussions. And I just want to thank you all on behalf of the organizers of the Black Forum, on behalf of the Global Diplomacy Lab, uh, a great platform for the enabling of public diplomacy for all of us. Otherwise, citizens like me wouldn't be doing this kind of stuff. Thank you all. And uh, we will have a final memento. Uh, thank you for your participation. Thank you all for being here.